Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this inspiring TED Talks HCI podcast episode, I explore Sean Aker's 2012 TED Talk, The Happy Secret to Better Work. Welcome back to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. It's great to be with you again today for this inspiring TED Talks HCI podcast episode. Today I'll be exploring Sean Aker's 2012 TED Talk, The Happy Secret to Better Work. It's generally assumed we have to work to be happy, but what if we have it backwards? That's the argument psychologist and CEO Sean Aker makes in his 2012 talk. Aker says we need to be happy independently of work and only then will we be able to increase productivity and success in the workplace? Searching for happiness in the workplace can be a deep rabbit hole that often leads to less happiness overall. This is an important message for leaders who seek to inspire other people in their line of work. It just so happens that developing happiness outside the nine to five hours is the most important for our health and success. Thanks for joining me and I'll catch you on the flip side of this first clip. When I was seven years old and my sister was just five years old, we were playing on top of a bunk bed. I was two years older than my sister at the time. I mean, I'm two years older than her now, but at the, <laughs> at the time that meant she had to do everything that I wanted to do and I wanted to play war. So we were up on top of our bunk beds and on one side of the bunk bed, I had put out all my GI Joe soldiers and weaponry. And on the other side were all my sisters, my Lowe's and ponies and ready for a cavalry charge. There are differing accounts of what actually happened that afternoon, but since my sister is not here with us today, um, let me tell you the true story. <laughs> Which is my sister is a little bit on the clumsy side, and somehow, without any help or push from her older brother at all, suddenly Amy disappeared off of the top of the bunk bed and landed with this crash on the floor. And I nervously peered over the side of the bed to see what had befallen my fallen sister and saw that she had landed painfully on her hands and knees on all fours on the ground. I was nervous because my parents had charged me with making sure that my sister and I played as safely and as quietly as possible. And seeing as how I had accidentally broken Amy's arm just one week before, <laughs> heroically pushing her out of the way of an oncoming imaginary sniper bullet, <laughs> for which I have yet to be thanked. I was trying as hard as I could she didn't even see it coming. I was trying as hard as I could to be on my best behavior, and I saw my sister's face this wail of pain and suffering and surprise, threatening to erupt from her mouth and threatening to wake my parents from the long winter's nap for which they had settled. So I did the only thing my little frantic seven-year-old brain could think to do to avert this tragedy. If you have children, you've seen this hundreds of times before. I said, Amy, Amy, wait, don't cry, don't cry. Did you see how you landed? No human lands on all fours like that. <laughs> Amy, I think this means you're a unicorn. Now that was cheating because there's nothing in the world my sister would want more than not to be Amy the hurt five-year-old little sister, but Amy the special unicorn. Of course, this was an option that was open to her brain at no point in the past. And you could see on my poor, manipulated sister's face conflict. <laughs> As her little brain attempted to devote resources to feeling the pain and suffering surprise she just experienced, or contemplating her newfound identity as a unicorn. <laughs> And the latter one out. Instead of crying, instead of ceasing our play, instead of waking my parents with all the negative consequences that would have ensued for me. Instead, a smile spread across her face and she scrambled right back up onto the bunk bed with all the grace of a baby unicorn. <laughs> with one broken leg. So first of all, I just really appreciate his humor. Uh, the story that I think we all can relate to of playing with your sibling on the bunk bed 
and people getting hurt and trying to avoid letting the parents know about it. Uh, I, I just think it's all hilarious and, and very relatable. So I appreciate that. Um, you may be asking, what in the world does this story have to do with anything? You'll find out quickly in the next clip. He'll unpack this a little bit and talk more about the relevance of, of his little story with his sister and trying to convince her that she's a unicorn. But think about when you are in difficult situations. Think about when others around you are in difficult situations. What are some of the approaches that you have taken to try to mitigate the the emotional anguish, the harm, the, the perception of obstacles and challenges? Uh, think about it in those terms and perhaps you'll have a clue as to how he's going to unpack this experience that he had as a young child. Well, we stumbled across. At this tender age of just five and seven, we had no idea at the time was something that was going to be at the vanguard of a scientific revolution occurring two decades later in the way that we look at the human brain. What we had stumbled across is something called positive psychology, which is the reason that I'm here today and the reason that I wake up every morning. When I first started talking about this research outside of academia, out with companies and schools, the very first thing they said to never do is to start your talk with a graph. The very first thing I wanted to do is start my talk with a graph. <laughs> this graph looks boring, but this graph is the reason that I get excited and wake up every morning. Morning. And this graph doesn't even mean anything, it's fake data. What we found is... <laughs> if I got this data back studying you here in the room, I would be thrilled because there's very clearly a trend that's going on there and that means that I can get published, which is all that really matters. <laughs> the fact that there's one weird red dot that's up above the curve, there's one weird in the room, you know who you are, I saw you earlier. <laughs> that's no problem. That's no problem as most of you know because I can just delete that dot. I can delete that dot because that's clearly a measurement error. And we know that's a measurement error because it's messing up my data. <laughs> so one of the very first things that we teach people in economics and statistics and business and psychology courses is how in a statistically valid way do we eliminate the weirdos? How do we eliminate the outliers? <laughs> so that we can find the line of best fit, which is fantastic if I'm trying to find out how many Advil the average person should be taking, too. But if I'm interested in potential, if I'm interested in your potential or for happiness or productivity or energy or creativity, what we're doing is we're creating the cult of the average with science. If I ask a question like, how fast can the child learn how to read in a classroom? Scientists change the answer to, how fast does the average child learn how to read in that classroom? And then we tailor the class right towards the average. Now, if you fall below the average on this curve, then psychologists get thrilled because that means you're either depressed or you have a disorder or hopefully both. <laughs> We're hoping for both because our business model is that if you come into a therapy session with one problem, we want to make sure you leave knowing you have 10. So you'll keep coming back over and over again. We'll go back into your childhood if necessary, but eventually what we want to do is to make you normal again. But normal is merely average. And what I posit and what positive psychology posits is that if we study what is merely average, we will remain merely average. Then instead of deleting those positive outliers, what I intentionally do is come into a population like this one and says, why? Why is it that some of you are so high above the curve in terms of your intellectual ability, athletic ability, musical ability, creativity, energy levels, your resiliency in the face of challenge, your sense of humor? Whatever it is, instead of deleting you, what I want to do is study you. Because maybe we can glean information, not just how to move people up to the average, but how we can move the entire average up at our companies and schools worldwide. The reason this graph is important to me is when I turn on the news, it seems like the majority of the information is not positive. In fact, it's negative. Most of it's about murder, corruption, diseases, natural disasters, and very quickly, my brain starts to think that's the accurate ratio of negative to positive in the world. What that's doing is creating something called the medical school syndrome, which if you know people who have been to medical school during the first year of medical training, as you read through a list of all the symptoms and diseases that could happen, suddenly you realize you have all of them. <laughs> So the entire point of that opening story is to lay out the foundation for what came to be known as positive psychology. That we, when we think about things in a positive way, when we try to frame things in a positive way, uh, that, that can actually change the way we function, the way our brain works and the way that we behave, uh, our productivity, our motivation, all of those sorts of things, we can sort of manipulate in our brain just by positive self-talk, by talking positively to others through giving encouragement, all of those different aspects of positive psychology that he's going to be laying out. And then he talks a little bit in the second clip about some research. And again, in his very humorous fashion, he, he puts up a completely meaning, meaningless graph, uh, but then he talks about statistics a little bit and outliers. And he jokes around about how in, in academic research, oftentimes we get rid of those outliers. 
And he challenges that, and he says specifically that he wants to study those outliers. He wants to understand that population, particularly that population that is above and beyond in terms of productivity, effectiveness, uh, satisfaction levels, happiness. Uh, what is it about those individuals that make them outliers, that put them way above kind of the average everyday individual, either at home, in your community, or in the workplace? So he zooms in on that subset, that those outliers that don't really fit the norm. What is it about them? Why do they have that heightened level of performance? Why do they have that heightened level of satisfaction, meaning, purpose in their lives? And what can we do with the people on our teams to help them to adopt those sorts of mental frameworks, that kind of a worldview and an approach that can help them find more satisfaction, more uh, engagement, greater levels of productivity in the work that they do as they find fulfillment in their work. As the video continues, you'll continue to get more into what we can do and why it's important that we try to do it. I have a brother-in-law named Bobo, which is a whole other story. Bobo <laughs> married Amy the Unicorn. Bobo called me on the phone <laughs> from Yale Medical School. From Yale Medical School, and Bobo said, Sean, I have leprosy. <laughs> which even at Yale is extraordinarily rare. But I had no idea how to console poor Bobo because he had just gotten over an entire week of menopause. <laughs> See, what we're finding is it's not necessarily the reality that shapes us, but the lens through which your brain views the world that shapes your reality. And if we can change the lens, not only can we change your happiness, we can change every single educational and business outcome at the same time. When I applied to Harvard, I applied on a dare. I didn't expect to get in, and my family had no money for college. When I got a military scholarship two weeks later, they allowed me to go. Suddenly, something that wasn't even a possibility became a reality. When I went there, I assumed everyone else would see it as a privilege as well, that they'd be excited to be there. Even if you're in a classroom full of people smarter than you, you'd be happy just to be in that classroom, which is what I felt. But what I found there is while some people experienced that, when I graduated after my four years and then spent the next eight years living in the dorms with the students, Harvard asked me to. Um, I wasn't that guy. But <laughs> what happened? <laughs> I was an officer of Harvard to counsel students through the difficult four years, and what I found in my research and my teaching is that these students, no matter how happy they were with their original success of getting into the school, two weeks later, their brains were focused not on the privilege of being there, nor on their philosophy or their physics. Their brain was focused on the competition, the workload, the hassles, the stresses, the complaints. When I first went in there, I walked into the freshman dining hall, which is where my friends from Waco, Texas, which is where I grew up, I know some of you have heard of it. Um, when, I, when they come to visit me, they look around, they say, this freshman dining hall looks like something out of Hogwarts from the movie Harry Potter, which it does. This is Hogwarts from the movie Harry Potter, and that's Harvard. And when they see this, they say, Sean, why do you waste your time studying happiness at Harvard? Seriously, what does a Harvard student possibly have to be unhappy about? Embedded within that question is the key to understanding the science of happiness, because what that question assumes is that our ex external world is predictive of our happiness levels. When in reality, if I know everything about your external world, I can only predict 10% of your long-term happiness. 90% of your long-term happiness is predicted not by the external world, but by your, the way your brain processes the world. And if we change it, if we change our formula for happiness and success, what we can do is change the way that we can then affect reality. The way we process the world, the mental framing by which we make sense of the world around us and our reality, changes our interaction with that reality. So as he was just saying, there's a lot of research that talks about happiness. Uh, lots of world happiness studies and literature, job satisfaction and workplace happiness, life satisfaction types of literature. And what they all consistently say is that your external environment only makes up a relatively small portion of the variance in one's happiness levels. It has much more to do with the individual and how they frame their external experience. I've done a lot of this research myself, uh, primarily looking at either life satisfaction globally or work satisfaction, job satisfaction, cross-nationally, uh, across various countries. And if, you, if, if it was really your external environment, the conditions in which you lived, your standard of living, for example, if that really was the, the primary indicator of your job satisfaction or your life satisfaction, you would expect for people uh, in the global south, third world countries, in more impoverished uh, places to have lower levels of life satisfaction or job satisfaction when they work in worse conditions, in worse environments. But while, while generally speaking that, that uh, trend does hold true, it's not 
always true. And there are many outliers. There are many uh, countries in which people who have worse living conditions, the general population is more happy with their working conditions, even though their work is measurably worse. And they're more happy with and more satisfied with their life. And why does that happen? Part of it's cultural, but a lot of it is just expectations and mindset differences. So ultimately, like he says, it's all about how we make sense of the world around us, how we choose to frame the world around us. And that is where positive psychology comes in. Because even if we are in a really tough situation, we have, we're not privileged in any way. We have the deck stacked against us. We're suffering in many ways. We've, we've had hardships. We've had traumas. Even if that's the case, and even if our, uh, our working conditions aren't very good, our standard of living is low, even if the external environment is not particularly positive, if we can frame, mentally frame that external environment uh, in more positive ways and how we interact with it and that we can see it as a growing opportunity, a learning opportunity, um, viewing it through the lens of a growth mindset, if we can do that, then we're going to be more satisfied. We're going to be happier uh, within those conditions, within the constraints that we have. That's pretty powerful stuff when you really stop and think about it. So what does that mean? As leaders, does that mean that we can treat people poorly? We can create bad working conditions that we don't have to worry about work environment, psychological safety, uh, physical safety, and such? Of course not. That's not what it means. But what it does mean is that every organization has constraints. No job site is perfect. No team is perfect. And so we can help empower our people to adopt more of an abundance mindset and, and that positive psychological approach that will help them be equipped to better and more effectively navigate the challenges that they face. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership, Ordinary Everyday Actions That Produce Extraordinary Results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data-driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. What we found is that only 25% of job successes are predicted by IQ. 75% of job successes are predicted by your optimism levels, your social support, and your ability to see stress as a challenge instead of as a threat. I talked to a boarding school up in New England, probably the most prestigious boarding school, and they said, we already know that. So every year, instead of just teaching our students, we also have a wellness week, and we're so excited. Monday night, we have the world's leading expert coming in to speak about adolescent depression. Tuesday night is school violence and bullying. Wednesday night... <laughs> Wednesday night's eating disorders, Thursday night is illicit drug use, and Friday night we're trying to decide between risky sex or happiness. <laughs> I said that's most people's Friday nights. <laughs> which I'm glad you liked, but they did not like that at all. Silence on the phone. And into the silence, I said, I'd be happy to speak at your school, but just so you know, that's not a wellness week. That's a sickness week. What you've done is you've outlined all the negative things that can happen, but not talked about the positive. The absence of disease is not health. Here's how we get to health. We need to reverse the formula for happiness and success. In the past three years, I've traveled to 45 different countries, working with schools and companies in the midst of an economic downturn. And what I found is that most companies and schools follow a formula for success, which is this. If I work harder, I'll be more successful. And if I'm more successful, then I'll be happier. 
That undergirds most of our parenting styles, our managing styles, the way that we motivate our behavior, and the problem is it's scientifically broken and backwards for two reasons. First, every time your brain has a success, you just change the goalpost of what success looked like. You got good grades, now you have to get better grades. You got into a good school, now you have to get a better school. You got a good job, now you have to get a better job. You hit your sales target, we're gonna change your sales target. And if happiness is on the opposite side of success, your brain never gets there. What we've done is we've pushed happiness over the cognitive horizon as a society. And that's because we think we have to be success successful, then we'll be happier. But the real problem is our brains work in the opposite order. Only 25% of workplace successes is attributable to IQ, to that raw intelligence that uh, is tied to your capabilities and skills. The other 75% comes from social support. It comes from uh, your resilience and your ability to roll with the punches. It comes from your emotional intelligence and your EQ. That is a, a tremendous thing that we have to remember in that recognizing that regulating, self-regulating our emotions through positive psychology and having a positive look at the challenges that we face, uh, that's an incredibly powerful thing. And so bad things happen. Yes, bad things happen to everybody. Even very privileged individuals still have hard stuff in their lives. Everyone does. So it's a matter of trying to figure out how we can better cope with those things. And we can try to focus on positive things, not to put our head in the sand and, and ignore the challenges and pretend like everything is, is great when it isn't. We don't need to be Pollyanna-ish and we don't have to pretend like everything is fine. Ultimately though, if we're only focusing on the negative, we're never gonna get to the positive and it's going to drag us down. There's only so long we can have constant uh, inputs of information that only focus on the negative without it taking a toll on our mindset. So we have to find opportunities to balance uh, the challenges and the hard things, the realities of the world that are difficult with the positive, the optimistic, the, the future forward-looking vision of what we can accomplish. And again, with an abundance mindset, with a growth mindset, ultimately we can start to see each of those obstacles as opportunities that we can grow into and learn from uh, for the next step in our life. And, and that's an incredibly powerful thing when you really stop and think about it. Also, he brings up the really important point about chasing success to find happiness. That only if we can have that success, if we can find hit that next benchmark, hit that goal, push ourselves to that next level, that then on the other side of that success, we will find happiness. But that's not the way the brain works. That's not the way our actual psychology works. And in fact, it's when we have happiness that our brain is much more effective and efficient, that we can be more creative and innovative, we can be more productive, and ultimately we can have more success. So happiness can drive success. Uh, of course, if you're successful, that can also bring satisfaction and, and uh, the, the fact that you're able to achieve things uh, can make a difference in your mood. But there are the, the history of the world, and just look out around us, you know, you can look at the most successful people. It's replete with examples of people that by any measure are incredibly successful, rich, famous, uh, influence, prestige, and yet they're intensely unhappy individuals. Success in and of itself doesn't bring happiness. It, it can be part of an, the equation of overall fulfillment and satisfaction and happiness in life, but ultimately you have to find ways to be happy without those successes. And that comes through the way we live our life each and every day, the way that we interact with other people, the relationships that we have with other people, and how we manage our emotions, self-regulate, and, and deal with our expectations. If you can raise somebody's level of positivity in the present, then their brain experiences what we now call a happiness advantage, which is your brain at positive performs significantly better than it does at negative neutral stress. Your intelligence rises, your creativity rises, your energy levels rise. In fact, what we found is that every single business outcome improves. Your brain at positive is 31% more productive than it, your brain at negative neutral or stressed. You're 37% better at sales. Doctors are 19% faster, more accurate at coming up with the correct diagnosis when positive instead of negative neutral or stressed, which means we can reverse the formula. If we can find a way of becoming positive in the present, then our brains work even more successfully as we're able to work harder, faster, and more intelligently. 
What we need to be able to do is to reverse this formula so we can start to see what our brains are actually capable of. Because dopamine, which floods into your system when you're positive, has two functions. Not only does it make you happier, it turns on all the learning centers in your brain, allowing you to adapt to the world in a different way. We found that there are ways you can train your brain to be able to become more positive. In just a two minute span of time, done for 21 days in a row, we can actually rewire your brain, allowing your brain to actually work more optimistically and more successfully. We've done these things in research now in every single company that I've worked with, getting them to write down three new things that they're grateful for for 21 days in a row, three new things each day. And at the end of that, their brain starts to retain a pattern of scanning the world, not for the negative, but for the positive first. Journaling about one positive experience you've had over the past 24 hours allows your brain to relive it. Exercise teaches your brain that your behavior matters. We find that meditation allows your brain to get over the cultural ADHD that we've been creating by trying to do multiple tasks at once, and allows our brains to focus on the task at hand. And finally, random acts of kindness or conscious acts of kindness, we get people when they open up their inbox to write one positive email, praising or thanking somebody in their social support network. And by doing these activities and by training your brain, just like we train our bodies, what we found is we can reverse the formula for happiness and success, and in doing so, not only create ripples of positivity, but create a real revolution. Thank you very much. The happiness advantage, it's a real thing. There is so much research on this that if we can just find ways to be content and happy and satisfied with, within the context, the conditions in which we live, that we can seek for the good, that we can focus on what we're grateful for, uh, give people genuine, uh, express genuine gratitude and give people genuine compliments for what they do. Focus on positive things. Of course, we need to realize when things are hard, when things are difficult, we can't pretend like something is great when it's not. But also, while we can still be realists, we need to also be perpetual optimists. We need to look for those things that we're grateful for in our life. And ultimately, that can help us to have that happiness advantage. When we have the happiness advantage, that leads to all sorts of other positive outcomes as he outlined in that last clip. And of course, for organizations, those same benefits hold true. So if we want our teams to be successful, if we want our organization as a whole to be successful, we need to have an abundance mindset, we need to have a growth mindset, we need to have a psychologically safe organizational culture, we need to have a place where people feel like they are supported to find their purpose, to align their values with the organizations, and ultimately have fulfillment in their work, and thereby find their happiness, find their joy. Uh, and that will lead to more creativity and innovation, higher levels of efficiency and productivity. Our happiness brain just works better, will have better outcomes. And it's good for everybody. That's good for the boss, that's good for the team, that's good for the individual, it's good for the organization. And so it may seem fluffy to focus on the good and to give compliments and to say thank you and, and to give genuine uh, appreciation to others. It may, it may seem hokey, it may seem like fluff, but if it's genuine and you help create an environment where others are doing the same, it is powerful. And that happiness benefit, uh, that happiness bonus in how our minds work will will bleed into every aspect of our work. I really, really like this this TED Talk. Not only is he an incredibly funny person, uh, tells a compelling story, but he shares some really important research that is very, very relevant. And I think all of us should take the time to do more journaling, to, to reflect on the positive things in our lives, especially when things are hard, especially if we're feeling down, depressed, if we're uh, blue and it, you know, just not able to get our emotions out of, of uh, the negative space, obviously sometimes that means we need counseling. Maybe we need some medication to help, uh, to help balance out uh, our, the chemicals in our brain. But a lot of that we can do with positive self-talk through various cognitive strategies uh, to to adjust our our thinking and to to disrupt the unhealthy thinking patterns that sometimes emerge, and ultimately it can drive more satisfaction, more happiness, more fulfillment, and and just overall that that we'll be able to be more productive in our lives. Thanks for joining me for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. As always, I hope you can stay healthy and safe. 
that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you have a great week. We are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.